Hi, everyone. My name is Will Hegard. I am the, or I work as the operations director for Footprint Project. I'm just going to gamble and try to move past my face. The Footprint Project started in 2018. We are still a very small nonprofit. Um, it's a very specific problem. I don't, do not need to tell anybody this. So I'm going to move the slide to the next one. The problem is how we respond to disasters have a direct impact on the cause of our disasters. So we started Footprint Project with the mission to help communities build back greener by providing cleaner energy to communities in crisis. Our original you know, bylaws are actually Im implementing sustainability principles in disasters, and that is a much broader problem. But we started with energy because there is a challenge here and the fact that we are using fossil fuel generators to provide on-site power in the aftermath of major disaster power outages has both a direct safety implication but also creates a basically a negative feedback loop of creating the problem that we intend to solve as we respond. Um, so yeah, it's pretty simple. We started with the energy problem by activating Assembling, activating, and deploying mobile solar generators to displace gas or diesel generators during the um, initial response through the recovery phase of major power outage disasters across the Gulf and Pacific coasts. I, this kind of all actually started when I was working as an a program manager and ambulance coordinator during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And a lot of this work is internationally where way International responders are way ahead of sustainability compared to domestic response. Um, I was implementing a program in Guinea, West Africa, and the plan was to burn $350,000 of CDC money on setting up five laboratory clinics to test for blood, SAMP, you know, Ebola, and other viral diseases across those five rural clinics in West Af Guinea, West Africa. We were going to train the find the five clinics, buy them a refrigerator, buy them a generator, buy them gas and reimburse that gas for the next year to store the blood sample that they take and then put it on a motorcycle, send it to Conakry. We test the sample, text the, the you know, results back. The challenge is the, the, if the blood sample doesn't stay cold, the fridge goes out, it doesn't work, right? Also pretty poor challenging country to do a cash reimbursement program for fos for gas. Not a, necessarily the easiest thing. And I came in and I was like, I, this does not sound easy. And I'd heard of solar refrigerators before and I was like, That's, that sounds easier. And I asked our logistics section chief in Conakry, hey, are, do these things even exist? Like, how do I get them? What's the plan? And they came back the next day Three quotes for solar refrigerators that were installable in the next three weeks. They were the only reason the grant was written that way is because the people that look like me wrote it and we were tasked with implementing it. So for me, I, let, I burned out after six months of that mission. We had installed the five refrigerators. They were working great. I left that and kind of wondered why is there not a overall kind of perspective of sustainability across the disaster space. That was in 2017. I think a lot has changed now, particularly in the international space for planning and thinking about what you're sending and why we're sending it and how we're getting it there, um, particularly in refugee camps or other large scale disasters where the diesel generator problem is significant and long term. I think domestically, we still have a long way to go to actively promoting and implementing sustainability in the response that could then bleed over to the recovery and actually see communities build back greener. Um, we implement three major programs. So disaster response, we activate as many mobile solar generators that we can beg, borrow, steal. We generally don't steal, but we some, no, we don't steal generators. Um, in a set region and then deploy them with community partners, everything from mutual aid groups to fire, um, you know, 
every literally anyone that plugs into a thing, which we all plug into the thing now because we all have phones. Um, in between, when the grid is back up, we we do what we were doing here during this workshop, where we build solar generators with community resilience partners. We believe. And we're still learning, but we believe the best way to implement and train folks on how to use a solar generator is to build it together. So what we were doing out to outside to, over the last two days was assembling four mobile solar generators with community resilience partners that will then get uh, go out into the community and power stuff. The goal is to get their hands dirty with the equipment ahead of the power outage disaster because a lot of people do not know what a kilowatt hour is. I'm gonna make you raise your hand. Does How many people know what a kilowatt hour is? One person. How many people should know what a kilowatt hour is? Everyone should raise their hand. How many people have had a power outage in their house for more than an hour? Okay, great. How many people have had a power outage in their house for more than a day? Wow, okay, you definitely, most of these people should know what a kilowatt hour is. How many people have had a power outage for more than a week? Okay, definitely know what a kilowatt hour is. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a, basically, you can power your home with alternative energy sources if you know what you're working with. Um, so that's what we do with Build Power Workshops, assemble them with community responders ahead of power outages so that they can plug in when the grid goes down. And then, Less of a program, more of like a general thing that we do throughout all our work is upcycle energy. So we incorporate upcycled components from the, the green energy industry into our builds. So the three, four solar generators that we don't, we're donating out to community partners this week all come with upcycled solar panels that came off of a commercial project that, are, that would have otherwise gone to a landfill. The inverters inside of the generators are also upcycled from our one of our biggest corporate sponsors, Schneider Electric. And I'm also gonna sh give a quick shout out to Sonoma Clean Power for sponsoring our work this week. We don't do this alone. And that's how we cover this work. So thank you, Sonoma Clean Power. Um, the We're still pretty small, but we have done some stuff. And I'm gonna talk mostly about Maui uh, and our work there because it's so so recent. But over the last five years, some of these numbers matter. Some of them don't. See that the kilowatt hour thing comes up again. None of you know what it means, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, but the whole point is that that if we can get people access to cleaner energy during the emergency response and recovery space, we can really tee up a conversation around how the communities rebuild, which really impacts the whole life cycle of that disaster. Um, so our goal is to get that equipment in fast, make it work, keep it working, and then uh, kind of work with the community through where they're and how they're gonna build back through the long term. Uh, let's go. The vision, long story, story short, our goal is to develop these d national, we're not international yet, we don't have the capacity, uh, of international or national networks of sustainable, deployable energy infrastructure, train folks how to use it, and pilot new models of community resilience once this infrastructure exists, which I'll talk about in a quick sec with, with Maui. So Maui has been our largest response to date by a long shot, and it's been a huge lesson for us in how we do our work. We're based in New Orleans right now, and most of the time when we're, when we're deploying equipment, we're either offering it to the fire person or the mutual aid network or the local you know, food bank to keep their coolers running, and then we're the ones that are hand holding them through what a kilowatt hour means, how to plug in solar panels, how to keep the system running in an off-grid kind of generator environment. What we learned during Maui is that no one has, <laughs> we called every solar generator company and asked them, you know, hey, what do you do? How many, what battery, what turnkey mobile microgrid system do you have on, you know, the day after that fire? And our answer was, the answer we got from 90% of the groups was they're all in Chicago or <laughs> they're in LA, take two weeks to ship. Not really helpful in the short term. 
Maui, interestingly enough, and Hawaii in general, is a has a very strong microgrid industry for a lot of reasons that I that aren't really important here. But the re what we learned is that when there is a strong solar and battery storage or solar and microgrid industry in an area that has a disaster, we don't have to get in a gas truck and drive batteries around to people that need them and help them plug in. We can just ask the, the microgrid industry to start assembling microgrids on site, pay them for their work, and employ local labor in setting up those systems, which has been game changing for us because it means that we can not only avoid shipping mobile solar microgrids to places, which is carbon, we can engage people that are already on the ground and need something to do when in many of these cases, the, the folks that are installing these microgrids, two of them have lost their homes in Lahaina and are finding a way to, you know, well, they know solar, right? They don't, they don't know how to do water. They don't know how to do food. They can, they're not, they're not a chef, but they can set up a microgrid. And so over the last three weeks, we have deployed more equipment than all of the last two years combined. And power, we're now powering nine, sorry, 11 microgrid sites across Lahaina, all of the major relief hubs, including, this is the biggest one at Napili Park. They were running, that generator up there is a 35 kVA diesel generator that they were running for the last week straight. They've broken four of them so far. So think about you know island you know four k thirty five kVA generators they don't have that many there and they were they broke four of them to power that refrigerator container to store all the food that was getting shipped in or you know distributed out of this park and the picture on the top right is a solar microgrid that we paid at local installers to set up with a large battery much bigger than the batteries out here to run that. So that refrigerator container indefinitely. So since we've installed, we installed that system 10 days ago, they have not had to turn on a generator at that park since. And I think there's, a, there's more just than the energy cost savings and I love, I could talk about that forever. That really doesn't matter. In many cases, it's the noise. People who are traumatized have already had gone through a lot and standing by a extremely loud generator while they're trying to do work is not helpful. The localized air pollution, there's a lot of good studies actually after Mar Hurricane Maria about how if thousands of people run portable gas generators in a congested area, the actually the air pollution locally goes up and it's actually measurable. And so not just the, if you don't care about climate change, great. But if you care about breathing, that is also a problem. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why this works. The, it doesn't work if we're just doing it alone. And in Maui, we've learned that if we can't, if we have the resources and we can funnel the resources, we can connect the industry with the sites and we don't have to drive the truck. And it's like a triple win for sustainability as well as employing local labor to assemble the microgrids. Uh, I'm just gonna click through a couple more uh, sites. This is Hanakawai Beach Park, major uh, aid station that we're powering a multiple refrigerators. This was set up by Sunrun using donated Tesla power walls. Um, I'm just gonna click through there. This is S-Turns, the, uh, the third larger micro, you know, relief hub. I mean, a lot of this stuff is refrigerators, comms, cell phone charging. They played a concert off of one of the systems as soon as, they, they, as soon as we got it plugged in. They didn't have to worry about the noise or the, the fumes for the concert and, you know, What's better than a little music when you've lost everything? Um, these numbers, some of these matter, but the biggest one in my mind is the bottom. And for us, sorry, the, the third line, which is the number of people served by the total microgrids daily. And that is for us the biggest number that we've ever been able to stand, work on or funnel. I mean, we're just the conduit really between the, the equipment and the site, but for, uh, for us, this is by far our largest deployment. And in terms of grounding resources in a community, 
we've dropped, we've been able to drop over $300,000 of microgrid equipment into Lahaina in the first two weeks of the response. And that equipment is never going back, right? That is never going to come back to the US. It's going to be redeployed or reinstalled or reconfigured and really left as community resilience assets for years to come. Many of this, much of this equipment has 10 to 15 year lifespans and the solar panels themselves have 25 year lifespans. So we're really, really looking at, okay, once the recovery, once the emergency response happens, once everyone's like, I need a break, I don't wanna go to the relief hub anymore, I'm gonna go sleep. Now what do we do for early recovery? How are we gonna kind of flip this stuff into power long-term shelters, you know, temporary housing, atmospheric water generators and all the other stuff that's going to be needed for the six to nine month period. And then once the actual stuff is rebuilt, and that can take, you know, many of the, I know you guys know this better than me, years sometimes. And these, a lot of times these construction generators are running for years. Once we finish that, where do, who's going to, where do they go for, do they go on the top of the church? Do they go on the school? Do they go on the fire station? All this stuff is just, couple thousand dollars to have a local solar company pick it up reinstall it at a permanent site so for us Maui has been like well if there is a local industry and we have the resources we can do this in a whole different way than what we currently were and we can have a much bigger impact I am going to quickly this was the the generator the the, the gas for the the generators at Hanakawai Beach Park before they set up the microgrid. I mean, the number of people I've seen smoking cigarettes next to these things, like I think most of us, if you've done response, there's always someone smoking a cigarette next to the gas tanks. Um, I think this is not a photo of Maui. This is actually from Haiti. And I want to zoom out a little bit and just think about what we send when we deploy stuff. We like, I love to help. I think we all love to help. And it's, we all wanna send the right thing. People need water, we wanna get them water. People need power, we wanna get them power. People need shelter, we get them tarps, right? But to be honest, like, if we can't figure out how to respond better, it's, I don't know, about, I mean, I don't know about, I, I'm gonna be 60 years old in 2050. That's all I know. It's 2023 right now. Got a long way, I hope I'm alive in 2050, but we got a long way to go. And if we can't figure this out, we're gonna be doing this conference. <laughs> There's gonna be a lot, yeah, it's just got a lot of work to do. Um, our North Star is climate neutral or even climate positive disaster relief. That is a very hard thing to get to. And I mean, if you, if you just take a second and think about how you would do a climate neutral response, trucks, shipping, like what are you sending? How are you getting that there? Who's Who's going? Who are we putting on planes? Do we put people on planes? Should we put people on planes if there's locals that can do this work? It's a it's a big question. And I definitely don't have all the answers to this question, but my goal today is, and thank you for giving me a platform for being able to ask the question, because we got to start asking it. And we have, and particularly the funders and the implementing partners. People on the ground need better tools in their toolkit. Funders need to actually think about this seriously. And this is solvable. This is not out of the realm of possibility. We could drop in sustainable infrastructure in Lahaina in a way that would completely rebuild that town. We could make it the most climate sustainable resilience town in the world if we, and the people in this room I think have that, you know, have the capability to do it. So for the next fire, after that fire, let's, let's just think a little harder. Thanks. Thank you, thanks Will. Did you tell people where your solar generators are going today? Oh, I <laughs> that matters.
Okay, um, how about this? While Jonathan is coming up and we're switching over, can you just say where the generators are going that you built? Yes, I wrote it on my hand because I almost forgot. Laytonville Fire is receiving one. They just drove away. Um, McKinsey County, thank you all. Uh, La Luz, a local nonprofit in Sonoma here, and Greenville. Yes. Yeah, thank you.